previously on For Wild's Sake. Trout conservation lies in, in a paradox where conservation needs anglers. Spent the last two days fishing two different headwater streams and the water was high. We didn't even see a fish. A lot of these cutthroat subspecies, as a result of non-native trout introductions, they are annexed like princesses and towers in these headwaters. Please listen carefully. Back in the White Mountains, change was in the air. Spring has always been associated with rebirth and new beginnings, but this year, and all that came with it, felt magnified. The small towns at the base of the mountains still hadn't fully reopened, which meant the traffic up our way was thinner than usual and at times, it felt like we had the entirety of the mountains all to ourselves. Each time we pulled into a new campsite, we'd scan the ground for footprints, but never found any human footprints anyway. There was, however, abundant sign of the area's most charismatic and controversial icon, the Mexican gray wolf, which despite being considered the most endangered mammal in the country, is making a slow but steady comeback here. They were all but extinct by 1980, when a significant effort mounted by the Apache tribe, state, and federal agencies began to turn the tide. It's been over 70 years since the founding father of modern wildlife management, Aldo Leopold's essay, Thinking Like a Mountain, was published, highlighting the importance and interdependence of wolves on the ecology of American woodlands. But despite the widespread reach of his convictions, the wolf remains a polarizing figure. At issue tonight is tonight's release of wolves in Yellowstone National Park. If we have wolves in one part of the state, we'll have them all over the state. We just don't want them here. In a very literal sense, we were here in the White Mountains looking for an Apache trout to illustrate. But of course, we could have easily studied existing photographic reference from home. The real reason we were here, prospecting the steep, ponderosa-covered canyons of eastern Arizona, was because the Apache trout represents an idea. A tangible connection to an intact, natural system and a lens into a world our modern lives have strayed dangerously far from. An ecosystem, in the truest sense of the word, with all its major players working together in symphonic harmony in a way that only a system which has been perfecting its rhythms for hundreds of thousands of years can. 
And in that system, every component is just as important as the other. The White Mountains without wolves would feel just as empty as the White Mountains without Apache trout. And though we hadn't yet seen either with our own eyes, so far, knowing we could was good enough. So where were the Apache trout? Well, for starters, not all of their range was accessible to us. The majority of their native watershed resides within the boundaries of the Fort Apache Indian Reservation, a truly massive swath of land encompassing 1.6 million acres or just slightly smaller than Yellowstone National Park. With only 12,000 residents, it's largely undeveloped and intact, providing critical habitat for the Apache trout. With the effects of the COVID pandemic hitting Native American communities disproportionately hard, the decision was made to close all access to the reservation from outsiders, meaning our chances of catching an Apache trout was limited to the few streams that are left in the national forest. The White Mountain Apache tribe were the first to see the writing on the wall in the first half of the 20th century. And as fish numbers plummeted, they took action, protecting critical streams and closing them to all forms of angling. Some of those streams, with the purest and most intact populations, remain closed in perpetuity. My tribe took the initiative and responsibility of, of protecting this fish that was only, at that one time, only found on the Fort Apache Indian Reservation. There was only a little over 20 some populations that were pure. Then you had some that were hybridized. Then you had some populations that were completely lost. The decision to try and save the Apache trout came 30 years before the creation of the Endangered Species Act. And the tribe's unorthodox decision to close its streams to anglers shows a distinct difference in the way indigenous groups view the value of the natural world. Native people, you know, always have been stewards of the land. We were put here as caretakers to care for Mother Earth. If anything, we know our land better than a non-Indian. The tribe just felt like if we're gonna maintain this species and maintain its persistence and longevity, we're gonna have to be the ones to do it. And if, if the state wants to follow, by all means, go ahead, you guys can follow. If, if not the state, if not the feds, then we as the tribal people are gonna do this. This is all we have left. So it's important that we strive and we work hard to protect what we have. We want it to be here for generations to come. We want our children's children to have that opportunity to experience and see this stuff. Because in the end, once it's gone, it's gone. But thanks to careful and diligent work, the tribe, in conjunction with state and federal agencies, have managed to culture the fish and then reclaim and repopulate many other streams and lakes, both on the reservation and off. Williams Creek being the facility that has a broodstock population, you know, now these fish are stocked on state waters in addition to tribal waters. If it weren't for the foresight of the tribe in the 1940s, the Apache trout would likely be gone today. The streams here aren't like a typical trout stream you'd find throughout the Rockies. Consistent and dependable precipitation isn't as abundant. After all, these small mountain islands are surrounded by the hot and dry lowlands of the Sonoran Desert. 
During spring and summer, snowmelt and monsoon rains can extend a stream's habitat to more than 20 miles, but by late fall, those same streams could have dried to only a mile or two. The difference between wet and dry years could mean a tenfold expansion or reduction in population size for the Apache trout. And it just so happens that all of the American West has been trapped in a 20-year drought. But remember when I said that Apache trout were one of the oldest living lineages of trout on Earth? Nearly a million years old, to be precise? As you can imagine, in that time, these fish have just about seen it all, from extreme heat to full-blown ice ages, and their evolutionary drive to survive and adapt has made them remarkably resilient and specifically suited for the conditions here in the White Mountains. So then why is it that within a hundred years of European settlers reaching Arizona, they were almost extinct? Well, there were two things the fish weren't equipped to handle foreign trout, and cattle. Much like the trout themselves, the Apache people had adapted to live in the ever-changing landscape, migrating with the seasons, adjusting their subsistence lifestyle to suit availability of food and resources. But the Western settlers, as the name implies, had a different strategy, to settle and shape the landscape to suit their needs. Armed with an entirely different worldview, they confidently sought to improve the landscape, to make it more productive and free it from its unreliable seasonal extremes. Overgrazing cattle trampled and eroded the small, delicate stream banks, and agricultural diversions sucked precious water away from rivers and onto ranches. As land was taken away from the native people, the non-Indian came in there and altered the landscape, and in my view, looked at it like, what's, what's the best way we can generate some sort of revenue? By cultivating crops and cattle, damming streams and planting larger, faster-growing fish within them, they aimed to reshape the mountains to something more akin to the fertile lands they'd left behind back east. Introduced brown and brook trout competed with the Apaches, and worse, transplanted rainbow trout, which still share enough genetic similarity from their ancient, primitive ancestors, freely interbred with them, slowly diluting and threatening to erase the heritage of Arizona's uniquely adapted trout. As their range and numbers became more and more constricted, the remaining fish had become increasingly vulnerable to catastrophe. When an entire population of Apache trout has been pushed into a few hundred yards of habitat during the hottest and driest months of the year, a single spark is all it takes to wipe them out. Fire is a natural and important force in healthy ecosystems, but our relationship to it has changed a lot over the years. Following several horrific fire seasons in the early 1900s, the U.S. Forest Service, as well as our national forests, were formed in an attempt to protect and manage standing timber, primarily from the effects of fire. It would take more than half a century before our current ecological understanding of natural fire cycles would develop, and several more decades before it was widely implemented. The current model is that fires, particularly those that start naturally, are left to burn in natural areas where they don't threaten human development. But fire seasons in the West have been getting longer and more intense, and the last few decades have seen devastating fires burn throughout the Apache Trout's range. When feasible, fish are captured and moved to safety before fires ravage their delicate homes. But in some cases, when the country is too remote or time too short, they're left to fend for themselves. The fish that survive the initial boiling heat and blankets of thick ash are often finished off by the torrent of floodwaters which so easily wash down the newly compromised hillsides. You get big mud flow sediment depositions. You can have huge boulder fields literally running down the stream. 
I've seen in some streams where boulders the size of a house have come down the stream. It's not uncommon for an entire population of unique and irreplaceable fish to be lost overnight. A patch trout, they're endemic to the White Mountains, only in Arizona. You won't find this fish anywhere else in the world. And they're only found in a couple drainages off of one mountain. In 2011, two men camping in the Bear Wallow Wilderness failed to properly put out their campfire, leading to the largest wildfire in Arizona history, eventually burning its way through over half a million acres of the White Mountains Ponderosa Pine Forest. Many of the small stream populations of wild fish, native or otherwise, were completely destroyed. Nearly a decade later, with a tip from a friend, we traveled deep into the heart of burn country, hoping to find some descendants of the few survivors. We do a few doubles. Basically like you can have three tacos and I can have two doubles. Sounds perfect. With stay-at-home orders producing record low airfare and automobile use, we were treated to the clearest view of the night sky any human beings had seen since the Industrial Revolution, and likely the clearest we'd ever see again. Like almost anything worth getting to, the roads to reach the Apaches would push our confidence and Bullwinkle's suspension to their limits. But once we reached the drainage, the journey would continue on foot. Needless to say, we were the only people out there crawling over deadfall with 50 pounds of camera gear staring intently at a stream that even a small child could easily step across. As soon as the pools widened to the size of bathtubs, we tossed out a question, wrapped in hair and feathers. Were there still Apache trout in this small, charred valley? It didn't take long to get an answer. This was as good as it gets. 
abundant fish that likely only see a fly or two a year and are eager to make the most of the short summer season. Every likely spot that could hold a fish did, and they were more than willing to oblige even the sloppiest of surface presentations. of fishing, it seems that you can only have two outcomes, easy access with tough fishing or tough access with easy fishing. We've always preferred the latter. Having barely survived the initial onslaught of the 2011 Wallow Fire, these resilient little trout had taken full advantage of their new deadfall habitat rewarding only the most daring and technical of casts. days we hiked and explored the fire-swept canyons, and we easily could have continued to do so for several more weeks and had no shortage of new pools to probe or fish to catch. But the downside, or upside depending on what end of the equation you're standing on, is the novelty of fishing this productive wears off quickly. All the things that make it special in the first place, the healthy and abundant fish, lack of human presence, and difficulty of access, rely entirely on the fact that people don't spend weeks harassing every single fish they can find, trampling the erosion-prone banks and leaving no stone unturned. With each passing year, our quota for having our fill continues to shrink, and we caught only enough fish to ensure we'd found an adequate specimen for illustration. The stream showed signs of rainbow trout introgression from the main stem rivers down below, an issue that was tackled two decades ago with the installation of a fish barrier by Arizona's Department of Game and Fish. But the chaos and ensuing destruction of the fires had all but washed it away. It's impossible to say definitively what the genetic makeup of a fish is simply by observing its physical appearance, but it's a good start. And while some of the trout displayed textbook Apache markings from the golden yellow flanks, large white tipped fins, and even characteristic bandit mask spotting around the eyes, others had pink lateral lines and heavily condensed spots far more like the introduced rainbow trout downstream. We know that before the fire, this stream contained Apache trout of pure lineage and that the threat of interbreeding with invasives was being closely monitored. Today, it's unclear how well they've held the line. Scheduled survey work in the coming seasons will tell a fuller story, but for now, at least at skin level, there were still plenty of pure Apache trout swimming freely in their ancestral water. The last few days felt surreal. Walking through a burned forest in the middle of the desert southwest, casting flies in crystal clear water to ancient trout isn't a common scene. But in some ways, it perfectly illustrated the beautiful contradiction of trout and the natural balance of wild places. We'll talk frequently in this series about the fragility of salmonids and their cold water habitats, and in many ways, they are. 
Degraded habitat, a warming climate, and most prominently invasive species do pose real and serious threats to our native fishes, and many species and populations exist on a razor's edge, while others have already been lost forever. But through it all, places like Arizona's White Mountains and their unlikely southern trout are a reminder of the incredible resilience of the natural world. The wolves, the fish, the forest, and the Apache people themselves have found ways of surviving in a harsh and unstable landscape. All they need is a fighting chance. For nearly a million years, Apache trout have braved fires, floods, droughts, and ice ages. But human beings and our hubristic ambition to shape and manipulate our world have proven to be an adversary they can't compete against. But with our power to carelessly destroy comes a great responsibility to protect, preserve, and restore because there's no other force on Earth capable of cleaning up our messes. With an unstable climate looming, these unique fish will need all the help they can get. But if we can at least clear the slate and let them do what they do best, adapt and survive, they've got every chance of making it through another million. We were coming into our busy season, which could only mean one thing. It was time to get back on the road. We had thousands of miles to cover, an endless wild country to explore before the first snow would fly again, bookending another brief Rocky Mountain summer. We said a reluctant goodbye to Arizona and left Apache country for the last time. Longer days, new country, and good friends were awaiting us in Utah and Bullwinkle was getting antsy to stretch his legs. Next time on For Wild Sake. Looks good!